working? Yes? No? Okay. Sorry. Um, hi. Thank you very much for having me here to uh, speak this afternoon. Glad I had lunch because it's always good to have lunch first. <laughs> uh, and I'll take my kids' advice who said, Dad, uh, stand up tall so they see you, speak loud so they hear you, and sit down quick so they like you. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, our current strategic situation in the world. As soon as I can grab these slides. So, I, you know, you wrestle with these things and try to think of a. Um, you try and think about how would I entitle this? This title says everything, right? That's, that's you know, the, the overall goal, the vision of what you want to get your point across. Um, and so I, I thought about this, and I said, well, this is the undiscovered country. Where we are heading into now as a nation state is basically an undiscovered country. And that... Is the microphone working? Sorry, is it, is it working now? Yeah. Okay, well, let's bring this up here. How's that? Not so good, I'm guessing. Do you want to hand me the wireless? I'll, we'll do that. Oh, can you turn it up? Okay, good enough. Better? Better? Okay. So I, I thought about this in, in the context of the undiscovered country, and that was a quote out of Hamlet and Shakespeare, and I three, two, one, uh, where Hamlet's deciding on, you know, contemplating suicide. And he says that everyone's petrified of the undiscovered country because it's a place no one ever comes back from, and they'd rather live with the horrible ills of the day than they would venture on into something unknown. And in, in a great sense, we sort of face a bit of that situation now. We have a lot of unknowns that we're heading into. More, I, I would venture to say for me personally, more so than we've seen in history. The pace of our changes are moving much quicker, and we'll go take a look at that. So before we start talking about one of the, some of the focus areas that I'd like to do today, which includes the rise of China, uh, espionage, Chinese economic espionage, and uh, the whole construct of fake news. Right? I mean, there are many, many strategic issues I could have picked. Those are, those are three top ones. And background-wise, I, I did part of my undergraduate and graduate in China and Taiwan. Got my degrees in East Asian studies and have been a China hand, as we're called, for the last many decades and have published academic literature in that regard. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it is a, um, a strategic challenge that faces the country, and one I would venture to say that we're sort of ill-equipped to deal with. But if you don't understand the context, right, if we don't understand, and, and for those of you who have worked for a career, you probably understand what, what I mean here. If you don't understand the backdrop of what's happening, whether it be in a company or globally, you can't look at a specific issue that's happening and say, oh, I know the answers, I know the policy. No, you really got to know the culture, you really got to know the background, you really got to know the strategic reasoning why things are happening. So that's what I'd like to look at first. Some of the discussion, some of the change that's happening. Sorry, that was loud. That, okay. Some of the change that's happening globally and how those things impact those three areas of discussion that, that we're going to have. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And... Um, well, look, we have a current environment of change. Uh, and within that, and that goes for the economy, that goes for even the construct of governance. Right? The way we govern now, the way our system was set up to govern, the telecommunications has blown that out the window. I mean, this country was never set up for Congress to decide policy and for the phones and computers to get shut down because the masses are writing into it and closing it down. You know, 250 years ago, that, that wasn't even a concept, right? So it was a slow, deliberative policy, slow changes that people got to discuss and move over time. They weren't ready for the tidal wave of public response that happens. So even our, our means of governance now is not changing the way we may have to change it in order to keep up with the technology and the global change that we're facing. And I give you some examples. And I'll tell you where I got this, actually. Um, I mean, I got it from here, but I got it in an argument that I had uh, when I was a director in the National Security Space Office. So we designed, uh, not me, I sort of uh, 
perfect to catch, right? So uh, I think engineers are the physicists designing. But, uh, but we designed what's called generation after net space systems, right? It's the most advanced technology on the planet. Where we thought it was going to go 20 years from now and design the national security space infrastructure to meet that. So we have a lot of arguments internally. You know, people saying, Nick, you know, we, we've been doing this particular satellite system for 20 years that hasn't moved and blah, blah, blah. You're, you're pushing too much change in it. And then I started thinking about it. I said, that's not the issue as to whether we can accomplish the technology. The issue is that if you look at 25 years ago, and I always thought of it in the space of one career, right? A person's career, 25 or 30 years, that they're working on more. Uh, we had no global positioning system, no GPS, which is a pillar of our armed forces, right? Uh, and our economy at this point, not to mention the world's economy. We had no smartphones. You know, I mean, I, I can deal with a flip phone, I know, but, uh, but these kids can't. I'll bet you my bottom dollar. <laughs> you know, no offense. <laughs> you know, you see that constant walking like this. I see it around campus a lot. Um, so know that internet, and at least the World Wide Web, was nascent. It was in its beginning stages. Can you imagine a society without internet at this point? Right? Laptop computers were just coming on, on. To say nothing of 3D printing, organ cloning, and all the other activities that we're, that we're currently doing, you know, and starting a lot of these things. 25 years ago, China was poor. It was still a developing company, a uh, country. Just hadn't even given most favored nation status. So in the early 90s, it was, you know, it was a poor, undeveloped country. The Soviet Union had collapsed. The US was the dominant world power. We looked at prosperity in those days and said, you know, the world is going to be different because the good guys won. Right? I mean, that's what it was. The totalitarian system had crumbled. So terrorism, international terrorism, was emerging. 1993 was sort of the biggest um, hit in the U.S. in the World Trade Center bombing. Right? And that was the first indicator that said, well, we got a problem and just a bunch of people doing skyjackings, as it was called in the old days, old days, or attacking targets overseas. We have things that are coming home. So that first indicator, which we missed at the time, but a strategic trend that was growing that we really didn't have a handle on. So this is actually bad wording, future trend. This, these are current trends that are, that are determining our future. So if we take a look at these current trends, uh, but societies are going to continue to integrate globally. Okay? Now, there's some extraordinarily great things in that. But 25 years ago, I could not get online, buy a product in Italy, have it produced in China, you know, have it have it reproduced and you know import into the United States without leaving my desk. Right? And that's the situation that we have now. So if you take this on a strategic context, and there's no turning that back. I mean, we're going to have other nations that are going to rise, and, and as nations industrialize, and as they develop, they tend to become nationalistic, right? We've seen that a lot in history, they tend, and that's one stage of nation-state development. So th there'll be bumps and flits, you know, fits and starts along the way, but um, that process of globalization is not going to stop. Now, if you have anyone has ever been in the Middle East, or in lots of countries, I'll say globally, that are less developed. I mean, every time there's thunder and lightning, people start, you know, still thinking God's trying to clobber them. Um, so there's a, a lot of problems in understanding that we are going to run into. This clash of cultures is going to happen for the next couple of decades. I mean, it absolutely is. I, I teach an entire block, not a block. I teach a, uh, I consult and have taught uh, on Chinese negotiating tactics. And part of behind that is the cultural dimension of what it's like in China, how you approach business, how you approach life. And our biggest problems, we can stem, you know, go right back to that. Lack of understanding of that culture, lack of uh, constant thinking what you think is right and wrong, and what you define, uh, you know, theft is, oh, it's wrong. Well, you have this Socratic belief that stemmed from the Greeks, and I'll take credit for that. Uh, but, uh, uh, stem telling you what was right or wrong, and that's what we all grew up with in this country. That's what the Western world grew up with in this country. So now we have the dynamics of civilizations all over society saying, oh, of course it's okay to marry a 13-year-old girl. What's wrong with you? I, I mean, and that, that's seriously the case. 
So you wind up with these cultural clashes that are not going to get any less you know, for the next few decades until those societies sort of get used to each other. Um, again, as I mentioned, the industrialization of other countries tends to lead to nationalism. So we see these blips of nationalism that occur over years of time, you know, over a period of years, and ultimately, as that country integrates into the world, that nationalism tends to drop as trade routes are expanded, as communications is expanded. Um, we have the entire authoritarianism that goes along with that, and that's yet another issue that we have to factor in. So again, keep these in mind as trends that we see occurring now for the future, and then we'll talk about the context of how we have to look at China, espionage, foreign news within that, right? So, climate change. You know, there, there are lots of debates on climate change, how much is man, you know, how much is man-made, how much is not man-made. But I'm telling you, you know, we got three times the amount of rain. I first I moved into a brand new house, and the first day I moved into a middle town, it was flooded. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you got to be kidding me. I'm up to my knees in water, literally. So there is, if you if you buy off on the fact that there's some function of climate change, I don't care what the reasons are at this point. You know, you say, okay, it's just getting a little screwy. The hurricanes are more powerful. Blah blah blah. The, Hotter, you know, however you want to characterize it, then we're fine. You know, you're in the United States. I mean, yes, we're going to have these things and we're going to deal with them as we always have. But I can tell you, because I've been, been to Bangladesh, if you're in, you know, low income Bangladesh, if you're in any number of other countries, you're going to lose people by the tens of thousands every time it happens. And it does all the time. So as climate change, you know, comes, as, as it advances, you know, we have these issues. Impoverished countries suffer the most. I mean, me pumping water out of my basement is nowhere near as bad as, you know, as the terrible tragedies that are happening to companies which don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. Right? So you get these kind of, and what do they say? You know what? We're not the ones screwing the environment up, the United States, China. You guys are. You're the ones who industrialize. You're the ones who are dumping the pollutants into the atmosphere. You are the problem. So there's a lot of that that's, that's coming into play. And if you take a look at it from their perspective, I get it. You know, Same way I get the fact that you have this enormous amount of pollutants in the air in California, uh, up to 37% depending on the specific type of pollutant, that come from China. I'd be, I'd be pretty pissed too. You know, it's great, good thing to know. But you keep your pollutants to yourself. Um, so we, we have these stress fractures that are going to go up. Now, I'm a big believer in technology. So i got to tell you, I, I, I think there's a technology solution to all of this. And it's not the first time in the world that people have cried, you know, will cry for, we're all going to die, we're all going to die, and it turns out that there are technology solutions to it. And I'll give you another example on a, on a story I read, which was fantastic. The London Times for 1899 reduces a result of a university study, produces a result of a, uh, of a university study. And that study says that within 30 years, London will be three feet covered in manure. <laughs> we got almost 12,000 horses in this city. And the buses had a dozen horses. Right? Everybody had horses. The, the largest city in the world at that point. The, the, the fields outside of London were all kept to, to, to maintain the horses. Right? Bringing, and they had horses bringing hay in for more horses. So the, 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 you know, the future is dire. And there was everything from three feet to 30, depending on what studies. And they had arguments in the press with all these, uh, with the academics of the day, talking about uh, you know, how, how our, our cities will be covered in manure. Uh, again, no one counted on Henry Ford. <laughs> this little guy in, in, you know, back in the United States decides with technology to change the paradigm significantly. So I, I am a big believer, and I think we're starting to see a lot of that now. Some of the shifts in, uh, in technology, specifically in environmental and related technologies. And, and again, don't look at it this year, this year, but our kids, by the time they're our age, our age will live in a dramatically different environment. And which will shape resource usage all over the world. Now, as we look at China, that's in increasingly important. As we look at the developing world, that's increasingly important. Because China estimates say could build one nuclear power facility per week, and they wouldn't be able to meet their energy needs for the next 20 years. 
Okay? One week for 20 years. That's what this developing middle class is sucking up in the way of energy. So then we start to look at the developed world, and they say, hey, F. Tamiatis, you know, I want to have a nice TV too, and I want to kick back and have a, you know, a 52-inch screen instead of living in a mud hut, you know, so, and I don't blame them, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, let's start with burning coal. So this whole dynamic, everyone's going to start using more power, regardless of where they get it. They're going to start using more power as the world starts to develop middle class. So th these are dynamics, and we'll look at issues like the South China Sea, and this becomes very, very important, you know, that need for power. South China Sea is not about China's territorial issues. It's about its needs for its citizens. So we'll discuss that a bit. Then I'd say it's about their, their territorial issues, and oh, this is China, but there's a reality behind that, the context behind that. Okay? Population migration. In the meantime, you know, as we're looking at these developing size societies growing up, we have an issue of, of uh, population migration. So I would tell when I was stationed in Europe, and you know, people would talk about multi, you know, multicultural societies, and I would think you guys don't have a clue. You really don't. I mean, we have had wave and wave and wave of, of, of different cultures coming into this country. And we've made it work, but we've made it work with a legal infrastructure that does so. And I'll give you an example. When I, um, I used to take the VIPs to the Tower of London. You know, VIPs come in and the dog and pony, okay, you know. And we, we'd get special passes and, and, and take them to the Tower of London where they had the changing of the keys, changing of the guards, right? And that's where you hear, hold, who goes there? Queen Elizabeth skis, and they march the person around. So I always looked at the generals when they did, when they, when they gave a speech and told a bit about what was occurring around them. And they said, we have done this ceremony other than one time. We missed it. Because we were getting bombed in World War II. Good enough reason. The king had to sign a, a, a dispensation. So, but, the, but they would tell our generals, and they said, we have done this, ex this event every day, the exact same time, for the last 741 years. So think about culture, and think about what type of unified culture you have to have that supports that. I mean, I, the only thing I, I think that we even have come close is to the unknown soldier, right? But everything else, I assure you, in 15 years from now, I mean, what do we need there? You know, go build housing or something like that. Because there's not that unified culture. There's not that history that, that tends to support that. We keep our society together through laws. Places like England, Japan, it's not the issue of law, it's an issue of culture. You don't do things because you don't do things. The kids are taught in middle school, as they go up, they have cultural classes of what's expected of them in society. And that goes middle school through high school. This is what is expected of you. This is the way you behave. Not an issue of law with them, it's an issue of behavior. So, we, when you start getting population migrations in, good and bad things that come of it. Um, you get some fantastic food. You know, you'll never get Mexican food in Japan like you can in the U.S. I mean, you know, try to read from there, it's terrible. Um, so, extraordinary things come out of it, and we benefit from having some of the most dynamic people that immigrate to this country who really want to build. Right? We, we, all have, we all have been there. We've all done that. But the negative side you get is that it changes the dynamics of the environment. It increases that global integration. Again, good things. But when you start talking about issues like terrorism, it also brings problems. It also brings lots of problems. And as Europe has seen, you know, and I've, I've dealt with a lot of the senior intelligence officials in Europe, and you know, the last 10 years, the problem is now in their backyards. Okay? It's not externally, which they used to be able to, to, um, to claim. Okay, uh, we have other dynamics that are changing. Large families are going to small families. So this becomes an issue in things like population growth and you know aging populations. We'll talk about that. Uh, Japan, by the way, if you take a look at Japan, the median age is about coming up to 50. So who pays the taxes you know, for the population when everyone's retiring? It's an issue, and, and they 
don't really allow immigration. They are having the, the, the heartfelt fight internally that they possibly can about allowing immigration to Japan. They really don't. They brag. You know, I had the Ministry of Foreign Affairs brag me, Nick, we've taken in lots of refugees. We've taken in, we've taken in 15 refugees from Syria. <laughs> Whole 15, huh? <laughs> Pardon me for doubting you all. <laughs> Sorry for doubting you. Oh, great. Um, but it, it's a real um, you know, unified population base. It's very homogeneous. And that type of um, change is, is not helping them as far as their aging population. China faces the same thing. China had a, um, I think the estimates, and someone could look me up, I could be wrong on this, but the estimates are pretty close to something like a third of the population will be, or a third or a quarter of the population will be 65 or older by the time we hit 2050. And that's because they had a, um, remember they had the one child policy for so long? So now they had the one child policy, so now what are they supposed to do? I mean, they're literally turning around saying, have kids. You know, now it's a good thing. What the heck? Make up your mind. <laughs> that's where I'd be on it. Okay, let's, um, I'm going the wrong, wrong way, which isn't uncommon for me. Jobs. So the U.S. had this um, uh, <coughs> tradition. Lots of people worked for one company or for life, right? Or the government for life. We lose them now five to seven years. People come into an agency, and my training coming on board was a year, right? You start, um, you know, and that doesn't include language training, right? You want to, uh, I mean, for people who are learning languages and stuff, that's another year or two, depending on what language you learn. So, and, and as you probably know, in the work world, you're not perhaps the most productive when you first get on board. It takes a little while to sort of, uh, you know, learn the run and learn the walks and get up to speed. So that person who's coming on board, comes on board, and they just when they start getting really productive, two, three, four, five, five years or so, they start moving. So I can't tell you how devastating, and I, you know, we, uh, when I was in the government, we used to have meetings about this, how absolutely devastating that loss is for industry, and particularly in technical, because it costs a fortune, right? It costs a fortune to replace a person, get them, train them up again, and get them just to the point where they start being productive before they go to industry and triple their salary. And, you know, we have this environment, and uh, as the Department of Labor said, six of the top ten jobs didn't exist five years ago. Technical knowledge is doubled every two years. This is how fast we're moving. Technical knowledge is doubled every two years. We are training people in college for jobs that don't exist yet on technology that hasn't been invented. I mean, that, that's basically where we are. So what, what is this, how does this impact us? The impact us is that our workforce, whether it be in private industry or in the government, now becomes lifelong learners, right? Particularly if you're in the technical fields, you can't, you're not done when college or when something is done. I mean, and I don't even care if it's if you're in mechanics or something. Anyone who's worked on a car is not working on the same car they worked on 15 years ago, right? I mean, you know, now they're in computer science classes, and you know, learning and it depends. You pick any technical field, and you have that dynamic that's coming into play. Then there's the entire thing of not working for the same company anymore, particularly with the millennial generation coming in. Um, now we, we get this whole uh, um, services-oriented approach, and a lot of that comes from the company. You know, I don't want to pay to have a person on board. You know, for the entire 35 years, I'll contract it out. So what happens to that workforce? Growing and growing, they're more oh, I'll go from this contract to that contract to this contract to that contract, and that's a great, different type of career path from what we've known. Okay? Different type of change that we'll see globally as societies move towards information-based societies. Privacy. It's going to be a huge issue for us. already is a huge issue for us. Uh, is everyone familiar with the Facebook Cambridge Analytica thing? I'm guessing, right? So uh, when you combine the issues of privacy and what your information you're willing to give up, to a, a private vendor, and that's fine. I have pictures of myself online, and, and yeah, I don't care. So big deal. Everyone takes my information, you know, turns it, cranks it, and turns out and spits out an ad that I actually want to see. Okay, not such a bad result. Nothing I'm going to lose sleep over. 
Um, there are areas that draw the line, like things like having that Alexa in the house. Because you know, like, I know you can record all of those things. <laughs> Been there, done that. You know, I was in technical operations for years. I, I know what you can do. Um, and I'm not saying I did. I'm just saying what can be. <laughs> so, um, so we do have this environment that we have ubiquitous sensors, right? They're getting smaller and smaller. And things that are put on clothes, things that are put you know, throughout society, GPS that's done in your phones. Right? Your phones have tremendous, tremendous capabilities now, and sensors are spread through And that's only going to increase. You know, sensors are now in your homes. GE stopped making regular light bulbs in 2016. Now all their light bulbs have uh, wireless sensors in them, so you can control wirelessly through the internet. And they actually stopped making the regular light bulbs then. So this construct of the internet of things Billions and billions and billions of, of, of you know, home utilities and appliances and, and lighting systems and all that online. So you can control. As an intelligence officer, I say, so I can control. <laughs> so, you know, so again, you know, look at it from the, you know, as, as my head, you know, you look at it from the vulnerability perspective and the dynamics of society changing around you make it really, really um, a challenge, a challenge to the country on how we're going to contend with this. And there's the issues of your personal privacy and the ability of having all that data, how you can be manipulated. And, you know, right now there's a lot of discussion about letting you see things that you want to see, that, that you're looking up online and how the information about you is taken to shape what you're seeing at any point in time. No, 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 Nick tends to go to these articles, so we won't show them anything about that. We'll just show them, they're called echo chambers, right? You start creating them yourself and the things that you look at, and the very, very smart software out there says, oh, Nick likes this, Nick likes that, Nick like, likes this. We won't show them anything like that. You know what happens in a while? Nick only sees this, right? Nick doesn't even know something else is out there. So, and this is a whole construct of fake news, but think of how that applies for fake news which we're going to talk, provided I can talk faster. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about the, the future loss of nationalism. Uh, lots of studies have been done, Generation Y, Generation X, and it's just even in the video gaming world that um, the younger generation has a tendency of looking at people, um, whether it's online, their communications with someone online, or the communication with the kid down the block. And in their head, they don't distinguish. That's a pretty interesting thing, because in their head, they're not making any distinguishing points between so-and-so in, in Europe or in Asia and their friend. And I, I, I've seen this grow up in my kids. You know, I'm studying my own kids this way. But uh, <laughs> as I look at them, and, and it's just, you know, who are you talking about? Abby in England and this and that. And in their minds, they're friends. They're not, you know, there, there is no nationalistic distinction between them. Now, what's that say for the next 20 years from now? Well, more and more, we're going to judge world generations that think like this and say, you know what, there is no distinction. We're all one people in their heads. I, great, I agree, wonderful thought. But our policy, our understanding has to understand, you know, has to be able to account for that and say, okay, well, that's the way we're all thinking. Our policy needs to be shaped accordingly. And typically it's not. Demassification. And I'll do this one quick. Um, mass media. I know you everyone's heard that term, right? It actually came out in the 20s when we started to push media through specific sources, right? Newspapers, and then eventually TV. And I grew up with three TV channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, <laughs> right? And then one other New York station, New York Channel. I was it. You know, we had four. And outside of Star Trek, I probably didn't care about any of them. But, uh, but, but uh, so that's, so now we have thousands of different media outlets that you can get your information from breaking down all the barriers that we've known. Um, so, you know, film, TV groups, and the same thing is true in manufacturing, industrial production, and energy. So those, and, and that is sort of one of the biggest dramatic changes that we're going to have over the next 20 years. Because some village in Africa, which is 30 miles away from anything, has had little opportunity to advance, right? They're distant from everything. And, and you know, pick a place. It doesn't have to be Africa. It could be the U.S. Pick some place with... Uh, limited infrastructure. But now, being able to do um, uh, 3D printing, 
Now, we're just at the beginning, right? The very beginning, just like we were in regular printing in the, uh, you know, in the 80s. It's, but now that they can do 3D printing, imagine 20 years from now when every little village has the means to produce its own, you know, its own needs. Energy the same way. When every, uh, you know, I did an experiment once in, in putting um, some sensors out and I had them solar powered. So uh, local villagers found it, stole the solar power units. <laughs> we found it on their hut. But, um, <laughs> not great, but, uh, but imagine when those villagers had the ability to do energy independently. Mm -hmm. The world changes. It changes by the tens of thousands that they do that. Okay. So now we have some contact, and I can't stress important, the importance of those two things a lot. Independent production and independent um, energy. Because that's going to rise a whole bunch of, of, of people who have been in poverty for centuries. It's going gonna, it's gonna to allow them to rise up, to produce, to become producing members of their respective societies. So big, big things that will happen in that. So let's talk a little about the strategic challenges that we face. In the context of this changing global environment, so we're dealing with the rise of China, which is currently challenging the world order. Okay? We understand this is the way you run things, and it's not just the United States. It's, I mean, we happen to be the world's leader, so we're, you know, we're in the target, so to speak. But we understand the way you've run things for the past few decades. We don't agree with it. We want things to run our way. Big issue because all the legal infrastructure that you've come to know and understand, you know, over over the decades, all the ways of doing business, all the, the common behavior and the legal structure that supports that goes out the window because there is no legal structure really in China. It's it's what the party says it is, and I, I just could cite hundreds of of everything from street fights of people jumping on people to to you know patterns of behavior in society that goes. It's not. Um, what you would call a, a society, a legalistic society, at all, right? Why it's dominated by the party? Why the party, Chinese Communist Party, controls the court system? Right? It's not a legal thing. You know, you could, as Chinese lawyers have pointed out, you ever been a Chinese court? I have, and it's an and this was in days you could go, and uh, it's an extraordinary experience. They bring the defendant up, and you know, the prosecution stands up and states his case. He did this, that, and the other thing. Forget about evidence; that's not included. Um, for any of these things. And then the uh, defense attorney gets up and sort of buttons his jacket if he has one, and he stands up there and, all right, oh, please, please, let him off, let him off. You know, look, he's so sad. Uh, that's, like, that's the defense. He's sorry, he's sad. You know, let him off. I mean, it, there's nothing like we would call it. Evidence right, wrong, all that doesn't play in here. And it, same thing goes through business and, and their world projection. Part of that is their economic espionage activities. So this country probably loses. I'll get to that. I'll go through that. Billions every year to economic espionage by China. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Gray zone activities. Uh, you may hear that that term come up. It's what we did, and um, it's basically sort of warfare on a level that won't give get a military response. So what do you do with fake news when there's some level of plausible deniability, right? In China, and you know, we know it's fake news because we watch the artificial intelligence take these stories and plant it out in thousands, you know, within a matter of seconds. In fact, I'll show you how to do it for just a couple of bucks. I'm, I'm not kidding, literally, next time. And then we have this whole world of cyber threats. Well, cyber threats are fine if they're inside your country, you know, go find out who it is, go knock on the door. But if it's coming out of a country that says, hey, tough United States, we're having enough problems as it is, you know, uh, regarding our own society, we don't need you to tell us it's your problem, not ours. And that's what we face with the issue of cyber. And it runs everything from terrorism to warfare to nation states exerting diplomatic, political, and economic influence. So, the rise of China. This actually started in 1996 when we granted most favored nation status. There was a huge fight in Washington that lasted for 10 years or so between what we call the red team and the blue team. The blue team were the ones who didn't believe uh, that, that we should open up like that to China and just give it vast wealth. Uh, and that, I would well, like to say, actually started at my house. Uh, the red team you know, was, was policy makers as well. And so what's proven over the last you know, 20 years? So it's proven that they were wrong. That we've had failed policy that has been incorrect. Because with that wealth, 
China has taken a very aggressive stance. You know, that theory that, oh, once they're economically wealthy, they'll demand political pluralism, was it? Plural. Plurality. <laughs> uh, was really wrong. It was, it was quite wrong. Uh, instead, let me see if I can bring this up. Ooh, so many slides here. Instead, we've seen a militarization of the South China Sea. So China, and you may be familiar, someone's coming up here now. Um, so what we have seen is China saying, well, the entire South China Sea belongs to us. And there's a nine dotted line that, um, that you'll see on this map that basically hugs every other country in the region and says, everything in this sea yeah, you're not really thinking much on that computer now, are you? Oh. <laughs> Just tell me how great it was. <laughs> so, um, uh, this nine dotted line uh, basically encompasses all of the South China Sea, and uh, which is all of the, you know, hugs along the lines of the Philippines down to Malaysia, Indonesia, comes all the way up to Vietnam. Everything within there, by the way, it's the most trafficked route in the world for shipping, belongs to us. That's why they call it the South China Sea. They started making this demand in 79. Coincidentally, six months before, uh, large um, gas reserves were found in the South China Sea. They, and they have intensified, and we'll take a look at um, exactly how they've intensified. Because this, where's my, uh, that's funny, where's that? You know what, I got it. <coughs> This is a um, fire, fiery um, high reef. This was it six months later. And this was it six months after that. So they built military bases, and their justification is great. Well, it's ours, and you keep running ships through it, so you're the one militarizing this. I always see China, and, you know, people say, oh, China never fought a war outside its own turf. Yeah, that's because they declare what's yours as their turf, and then they go to war. So, but as I said, context, that's Mischief Reef, and that's it now. And just this segment alone in the center you see is bigger than Heathrow Airport. So it gives you an idea of the type of uh, massive investment that they've made in this. And what this really, this is not about what China thinks it's ours. 